share those as well. Um, you know, everything helps. Honestly, it does. The more people share things, the 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 more the show gets acknowledged and it boosts up the uh, you know where on where on fall in the ratings. Um, I'm also going to be putting uh, this show at a fixed day and time. So at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time every Wednesday, the Nowhere to Go But Up podcast will have a live stream of pre-recorded episodes and also live shows uh, when guests schedule can accommodate that. So tune in weekly at 6 p.m. Uh, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And then here is a uh, uh, work that they're doing. Uh, that their organization does for wrongfully convicted men and women. And my guests today are a part of another organization that helps currently incarcerated people called Inmate Options LLC. And they have a YouTube channel as well with a lot of stories of currently incarcerated uh, people and uh, a part of the uh, conspiracy deal that happens in our federal system. I think it happens in the state, but the federal, you end up with way more time. So I want to introduce now uh, my guests, Dennis and Ava. Now, let me get uh, their banner up here. So Dennis and Ava have written a book called Burden of, or actually the Inmate Options LLC has written a book called Burden of Proof. And uh, I'm going to unmute uh, Dennis and Ava here. Uh, hey, guys. How are you? Good, good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm doing great, man. Thank you for uh, joining me today and, 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 and uh, struggling through that, uh, that first intro there, uh, all that, uh, that, that uh, announcements and stuff. Thank you. How are you? Good, good, good. Is uh, Ava, can you hear us? Yep, I can hear you. Good morning and thank okay. you for having us. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And and this is, uh, so let me give a little bit of backstory here on how we actually came to be. So uh, I have a buddy, his name's uh, Joe Martinez. He has a podcast called uh, Talk from the Cell Block. And he had uh, interviewed Melissa Veach. And he thought that it was such a compelling story that, that I should interview her as well. And so I did. And I, I'm also a, uh, uh, somebody who's been to federal prison. And that's the first time that I'd ever heard anything about conspiracy and not having and ghost dope and all that other stuff uh, that terms that you may hear in this conversation today. And I was like, all right, well, I need to look a little bit further into this. And around the same time, I'd been uh, promoting the con and in contact with the uh, producer of that. And so I was like, uh, you know, and I watched that whole thing. And, and some of the uh, structure that the con lays out was really similar to the structure of the, the justice system. Um, and so I was like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. There's got to be something more here, right? And uh, I started digging into it a little bit further, and I got contacted by one of the, the people. And we're not gonna we're not gonna use uh, names here, but uh, we'll, we'll use a DS, right? Uh, contacted me and was like, "Hey, I'm, I'm I'm digging what you're doing, and you know, here's here's you know what I know about the situation, and any help that you need, you know, fine." And she reached out to all these other inmates that she's in contact with and now they're contacting me and I'm going to get their stories and basically do the same thing that you're doing. But I want to dig even deeper into this and turn this into something, you know, cause I think that there's something here and I'm not going to go too much into that, but please, you guys explain to me how you got to this book um, and how you, and what brought you to this? Because you're obviously passionate enough about it to have written a book about it or been involved in, in the writing of a book about it. Uh, so, yeah, I'm really interested. Yeah, so uh, probably about six months ago, uh, well, 
longer ago than that, we had started an inmate service company. Uh, we had family members that were incarcerated uh, for extensive amounts of time, and we wanted to provide services for them uh, to help them with any and everything. Well, as we're um, as we're advertising and, and uh, letting inmates know what we can do and how we can help them, someone reached out out of the Northern District of Texas and said, hey, I'm having a really hard time with my case. I've exhausted all my uh, uh, court remedies. I have really nothing left. I'm just hoping that somebody will look into what happened in my situation. So he sent us a bunch of paperwork um, and his judge in the case uh, was John McBride. And when we Googled him, uh, we were just shocked just in that aspect. Before we even got to his case and the particulars of that, just the judge itself was shocking to us to read um, what what was online about what he had turned his courtroom into, how he treated people. I mean, this is these are these are people that were, you know, fighting for their lives, and uh, it should be a, a place of fairness. And and it, the the way that he was described online uh, was just awful. So after that part, uh, we began to look into his case, and we noticed that um, even though he was accused of. of uh, trafficking in dozens of kilos of methamphetamines and um, he was accused of having a gun and importing drugs from Mexico that he was homeless and that he uh, didn't have a car and and it was it was just confusing to us how this guy could be responsible for all these things so Oh, as we continue to talk to him, he said, you know, I'm not the only one. There's many, many others. And um, he started to connect us to people. And then we realized that what they had done is they had created these, uh, they call them interrelated indictments. So some of these people know each other. Some of these people don't know each other, but they've been able to connect hundreds of people into these um uh, into these indictments and it, it, none of it are very, a very small amount of it is based on actual evidence. The majority of it is based on um, one person or a couple of people saying this person did this, this person did that. Uh, they don't have any recordings. Uh, there's no um, controlled buys. There was no, uh, I mean, nothing was ever seized from these people. I mean, it's just it, when you when you go through it step by step, it, it's just one red flag after another that there's something wrong here, that these are not people that are responsible for these massive amounts of drugs, that something is has uh, been missed. So, so I'm going to back yeah. you. I'm going to I'm going to stop you okay. right there and back you up. Just just one moment there. So. Okay. What what you're saying is, is that there's no like when I think of an investigation, I think of, you know, what you see on TV where you you, you know, or actually what happened to me when when I went through mine, uh, there was five controlled buys. You know what I mean? There was uh, evidence uh, of drugs uh, that have to be tested in order for uh, for me to be prosecuted because they got to know that it's the real stuff, you know, that it's not fake or, you know, because that happens. Um, and there's a whole process that goes along. They were watching me. They were tailing me. They were doing all kinds of different stuff. So you're saying that, and, and I got, I got what, I, th I think I got 15 to 60 month sentence in the state of Nevada, which is one of the harshest States. Um, so you're telling me that, that none of that is present in any of these, these uh, indictments that are interrelated and, in, and then also, too, how many indictments were there at the beginning that were interrelated when you started your uh, you know, the, the for the book? Right. So um, so in the book, we have an exchange uh, and these are we tried to get uh, as much of this out of court documents as possible. So there's no refuting the facts. 
And um, in the book, there's an exchange between a case agent who is uh, in charge of uh, a lot of these indictments, a lot of these people that were indicted, and a lawyer. And he describes that um, there was very little, um, he called it an historical investigation. So there was very little investigation done outside of cooperating co-defendants. And and, and at that time, he says that there's over 150 uh, individuals um, that were in these non or interrelated indictments. Now, to the amount of indictments, we're not exactly sure how many have come out. It seems as though they would indict a group of people and then add them to this uh, larger indictment. And in doing that, there were so many people that it kind of um, it, 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 it created this this massive amount of people. It was hard to decipher who was who, what is what. And for us, I think it just added to the, the chaos of all these other situations. It made it difficult for the for the individuals to say, OK, well, who who said what about me? You know, and, and a lot of them came forward and said, you know, the people that I have that said that uh, I sold them drugs or I they see me with a gun. I don't know these people. I've never met them. That was a very common theme throughout this uh investigation and in this book was the people that have said these things about me you know i don't know them and i guess that's part of adding all of these people to those indictments is uh it, it got kind of uh, away from you know who was actually involved so of the of the the defendants um and i, I mean i'm only speculating but i mean of these defendants i mean i've i've heard it said that uh you know you probably wouldn't uh wouldn't trust i'd say i'd say 80 percent, 90 percent of them with with holding 50 dollars let alone you know how many kilos did they say that they that they had uh some of them doesn't some of them were as high as 57 kilos uh okay so that's hundreds of thousands of dollars in cash okay the, right. the cash value yeah. of all right. So I mean, I, I I'm I'm almost going to uh, bet. I'd be willing to bet the house that that a good portion of these people probably never even seen more than an ounce in their life. All right. There's been some that you said were homeless. I know I know of one. I read some of his stuff. It was uh, he was living in a storage unit. Um, yeah. You know, Melissa Veach was barely, uh, barely making it wherever she was. I think she was living out of her car at, at one point. Um, yeah. I mean, these these are not people that have access to forty nine kilos of of methamphetamine. I nobody's right. going to give these people that that kind of drug. So, I mean, how did they arrive to that amount? That's what baffles me is like, what, how would you even get to that amount? Cause I think it started at what 50, 50 grand or 50 ounces. And then it, and then it got superseded and then all this other weight got dropped onto it. No, you had it right. The first time, most of them started out at 50 grams, not 50 ounces, 50 grams. Most of the mm-hmm. paperwork yeah. says in it 50 grams or more of methamphetamine. So uh, actually what Ava just touched on is, so this is how these individuals felt they were tricked into this. So again, most of them were struggling addicts. They would sign these uh, plea agreements admitting to 50 grams or more of methamphetamines, which is less than two ounces. In the course of a drug addict's life, uh, that is a very feasible amount of drugs. After they sign that plea agreement, uh, they get uh, what's known as a PSI or a PSR, and that's a pre-sentence investigation or pre-sentence report. And in that report, they'll have a, a list of people that have said, um, I bought six ounces uh, every week from him for eight months. And they'll add all of that, all of that, all those amounts up, even though there's no proof of that ever being uh, possible. They'll add all those amounts up and then they add it on to their sentence. So their sentence is directly um, directly affected by the, the amount of drugs. So 
at the end of it, they signed for 50 grams. They're probably looking at, you know, five years, something like that. And then they get closer to sentencing and they're told, well, actually you have a criminal history. So you're a career offender and you're being held responsible for a gun, importing drugs from Mexico, uh, maintaining a household as a stash house and uh, a million dollars worth of meth. And you're looking at, uh, you know, 30 years, 20 years, life sentence. Couple that with the fact that most of them had one of the strictest federal judges in the nation in John McBride. Uh, these people were given decades and decades in prison. And and also add to that fact that uh, I think all but one or two had money for an actual attorney and they all had public defenders that kind of pushed them through the system. Uh, they had no chance. There was no chance at all. And And on top of that, they were told we have court documents where they're told if you challenge uh, the drug weight, if you challenge, um, if you know these people, if you challenge any of the things that we're laying out, you're not taking responsibility for your crime and we're going to take away your acceptance of responsibility. Those acceptance of responsibility points uh, reduce their sentence by three levels, which is, you know, anywhere from like five, 10 years. It, you know, it could, it's all completely up to the judge. But those threats uh, made people be quiet and they they went into sentencing, hoping, praying, family members, praying that there would be some sort of uh, justice. Somebody would see this is not the person that they've made him out to be. And that never happened. All of these people were given uh, decades, some of them life sentences. Some of them will, will die in prison if people don't get involved and do something uh, to help them. Yeah, that is a, uh, that, that is a definite shame. And I've read, a, I've read a lot of stuff on uh, McBride and, you know, in, I, I was given a uh, link to reviews of a judge, right. Of dis of all the judges that you can review them. Uh, and the, the main thing that keep, that kept going through that is tyrant. Um, that this yeah. guy's a, this guy's a tyrant. He's, uh, a bully. Um, you know, he's, uh, all, all kinds of, of, uh, things that aren't friendly to the process of, uh, law and justice. Um, he's, he's probably the exact opposite of what, what that should mean. Um, so yeah, I mean, he's definitely going to be a, a, a target or a focus on 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 what I'm going to do because that's that's one of the huge problems. Because really, what he was what he was doing, from what you explained to me, was uh, kind of bending people to his will uh, through through consequence, and he did it very early on. So now anybody that comes into his court is doesn't want to challenge it. Because they already know what the outcome is going to be. Oh, I don't want to. You know what I mean? It's like going into his courtroom is is more of a burden than it is a a, a blessing. You know. Well, not only that, but in as you talked about Melissa Veach, in Melissa Veach's case. Hold on, you're. Uh, I'm not. I'm not hearing you. Are you there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I missed everything that you were talking about. You, you, you cut out. Yeah. Are you there? Oh, okay. No. Yes. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. Go ahead. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. You so, said the Melissa uh, Veach case. Yes. Back to Melissa Veach. Um, so she was held responsible for 1,281 ounces, I believe it was. And her attorney reached out to the individual that, supposedly cooperated on Melissa Veach. And that individual told the attorney, I never said 1,281 ounces. I said uh, 71 ounces, which was a, a massive difference. So the attorney reached out to John McBride in the form of a memo. That memo is in the book. And he said, hey, uh, Melissa Veach is, is facing a significant amount of time. This woman is saying she didn't say these things that she said 71 ounces instead of 1,281. Uh, I need some time to talk to her. Melissa Veach is getting sentenced.
uh, like I said, that's in the book. He said, uh, this is too vague. Um, I, I really don't know that you need an extension. So then he wrote another one giving specifics about the woman, about, you know, ev everything that she was being transferred, that he needed time to get a hold of her, all these things. And his second response is uh, the court is reluctant to upset the schedule, that there's a schedule uh, that is being kept. Um, that was one of his, his biggest things in the beginning. You'll read about him online is that when he came in uh, as a federal judge, there was a huge backlog of cases and that he ran and like, he pushed all these cases through and cleared out this backlog. His his schedule, for some reason, was was uh, something that he liked to keep. So Melissa Vita's attorney was never able to have this uh, evidence admitted into court. And uh, Melissa Vita was given 400 months in prison. And, and she wasn't the only one. There was others that said, that came forward, others that we've talked to that are free that came forward and said, I didn't say these things about these people. I don't know how... Uh, my name came up in their paperwork. I don't even know that person. So our, our question became, well, how is that happening? How are these people saying, you know, I, I, I'm i not the one that said this, even though this person's sitting 20 years in prison for a crime that they allegedly said that they have done. So we, we started to uh, investigate that part of it, and we found some concerning aspects. Uh, I think it was in 2014, Eric Holder came out with a memo saying that all um, federal investigations uh, should be recorded. And it, it's a long standing thing through most state uh, institutions that if they're coming in to question somebody that they record it, uh, that's, 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 that's evidence. If somebody admits to a crime, they have it on recording. Almost all of these cases, there's no recordings. There's no. Uh, there's no way for them to go back and say, OK, well, I want to hear where this person said that I sold them six ounces of meth every day for the last six months. There's nothing. So they have no way to refute the facts other than reaching out to uh, these people, which has problems in itself because they're uh, cooperating co-defendants. And that could be, you know, tampering with the witness. So they had all these problems and all these roadblocks. And, and then again, they had had attorneys that uh, weren't paid for. So, uh, you know, all they could do is just hope at the end that the judge would be fair and there would be some sort of justice. And that's, that's not what they received. No, they got, I mean, in a lot of cases it was, uh, you know, I mean, and this happens from, from the time you get arrested to the time you, you actually get out of prison is you're constantly being indirectly coerced, uh, to do things. And it seems yeah. like that judge was indirectly coercing, uh, even prosecutors to not challenge anything. Absolutely. In, in, in the book, again, uh, we, we have documents Well, we have court documents ourselves uh, where in there, um, the judge is telling them, you know, if you continue to question, um, so Stephanie Hatley, for instance, Stephanie Hatley, uh, had a boyfriend who was held responsible for a gun. There was people that said that he had a gun. They held her responsible, even though she had her lawyer brought it up in, in court, which is in the book that Stephanie Hatley has never been accused of having a gun. She's never been accused of being around a gun. How is she being held responsible for this gun? How is she being held responsible for these drugs that are being imported from Mexico? And his response is basically um, that it's, it's well known that uh, people in the drug world have guns and it's, um, it's well known that these drugs come from Mexico. It, it's not. It's not law. It's not based on facts. It's conjecture. It's. It, it's just. It's stuff that the average American citizen would not believe is happening in the court system, or uh, that is being allowed in these cases. But it is absolutely happening. And I, I'd also like to point out, in the back of the book, there's a list of individuals. Uh, we've talked to close to 100 people. There's uh, there's many, many more. Um, we didn't have the resources or the book space to be able to add all of their stories, but they all have a story. 
they've all uh, been done wrong in a very serious way, and uh, there's there's nobody helping them. Yeah, well, we are. We're trying. Yeah, um, you know, and and you know what I'm what I'm attempting to do with the uh, uh, the interviews that I'm going to be conducting. I mean, it's not it's not unlike what you're already you've already done. Uh, except there may be some other uh, some individuals that you don't have on yours uh, that that I'll have on mine, but I'm also going to be going in a, a little bit of a different direction. I want to talk to people in different states as well, uh, in different districts that have been uh, on a conspiracy charge for the same type of crime and and show the difference. Uh, in in you know between this district and this district, it's just like you know the same crime should have the same time. doesn't matter where you are. Absolutely. And an, another, another part of this too, is that, that people don't know is that when you actually part of that PSI or PSR is uh, it gives all of your criminal history as well. And so your points are, and where you're going to be placed are directly uh, affected by what's in that, that criminal history. Right. So like I, I got Absolutely. charged with, yeah, like I, I had been charged when I was 18 for assault with a deadly weapon. And because of that charge, which I'd already done, you know, my punishment for that years ago, that came back up when it came time to do my sentencing. And that that prevented me from going to a camp, which was what my uh, what my charges, you know, would allow because it was a first time offense. And I would have been eligible for a camp, but because of that, it, it stopped me. So I ended up in a medium. So there's tons of uh, uh, examples of how you're, you're constantly being, uh, uh, what is that? You're, you're, you're having to re rehash, uh, you know, consequences, you know, for things you did a long time ago, which is ridiculous. I mean, you know, you, you, you did your time. It's, it's time to move on. It shouldn't keep following you forever and forever in a day. I mean, people can change. Look at myself. You know, I went from what I was to what I am now. And, and I mean, it wasn't easy, but it, it it's also possible. Yes. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So, um, as struggling addicts, a lot of them, uh, you know, they would have, charges for uh you know stealing or whatever they were doing to support their habit and what would happen is you know as struggling addicts they get locked up uh they're going through withdrawals they're coming down they're wanting to get high again i plead guilty just get me out of here they get back on the streets they get back to getting high and that's their cycle of life well when they catch these federal indictments all of a sudden, all of these little charges that they've caught along the way are being used and added to enhance their sentences by uh, years and years and years. So that's another way that the system has failed them. Um, it, it's taken these these small charges. They're not even uh, serious offenses and allowed the, the system to add more time. Also, uh, to touch on your point about uh, using charges that affect you in prison, a lot of them were accused of having a gun, even though there's no evidence. They've never been caught with a gun. Uh, nobody's ever photographed them. No police officers ever seen them with one. Uh, based on these conspiracy cases and, and other people saying that they've seen it, um, when they get to prison, they're not allowed certain programs. So there's an RDAP program. They can take it, but they can't get the extra time off it's an in-house uh drug treatment uh, program for the federal bureau of prisons um they can take it but they don't qualify for the extra time off because they have these uh gun crimes and they're it's not real. they they've they've said over and over i don't like guns i don't have anything to do with guns but this is just an added uh injustice to all of the other pieces and parts of this is uh, stuff like that. So I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I mean, it's their, their enhancements, uh, you know, for everything, you know, you get an enhancement for this. I think, I think just being a felony in possession 
uh, it carries a maximum of five years or, or a minimum of five years, something like that. It's some ridiculous uh, thing, at least in California. And I think that was because of the uh, three strikes uh, rule um, that was really crazy. And then even bullets are, are can get you hemmed up for uh, it being felony, uh, felon in possession. So yeah, it's, it's all, it's all kinds of crazy stuff. I had uh, a bunch of things when I got out, um, to wherever I paroled, uh, or pro it's not really parole there. They, it's supervised release in the federal system. Um, there were, there were firearms that were in a safe, uh, in the house that I was paroling to. So, I mean, there had to be like dead bolts and all kinds of stuff that had to, to happen for me to be able to get signed off to, to move back to my, my parents' house or my mom's house. Yeah. It makes it extremely difficult. Uh, even the people that do have the prospect of getting out one day, which are, which is, which is few, especially with COVID uh, ravaging the federal prisons. Um, the few that do get out, you know, they have these huge gaps in, in their time, their work, um, their work history, 20 years is gone. Their children have gone from, you know, kids to adults. They've lost all of this time. People have died, family members, mothers, fathers. And for what have they lost this time for? It's not because, um, you know, they've killed somebody or they've been involved in some city serious drug trafficking fence they've lost this time because uh they've been lost in a system that was meant to protect them that was meant to in the in the book there's a section that talks about the system is meant to protect the guilty and the innocent alike and um the guilty are supposed to receive uh, sentences that are fair and just to the offense and that is where even if these things were true and they did sell these drugs, do they still deserve life in prison? And, and to add on to that, that these things are not true. I, I just, I, my hope and my prayer is that the book, their stories will get into the right hands that people will get to the point where they uh, investigate this themselves. We, in the back of the book, there's family contacts for each individual person uh, people can reach out to their family members and get their paperwork. They can hear their stories. Our, our hope is that, that people will get involved, that people will start making phone calls, that people will call people in positions of power and, and uh, demand that there's some sort of relief for these individuals, that there's somehow um, somebody can explain how in Ashley Simpson's case that the only person to put a significant amount of uh, drugs on her was a person that was sleeping with her boyfriend at the time uh, that was a mistress. And um, after she gets locked up, they find out about each other. And now all of a sudden, this person is aware that uh, Ashley Simpson's been trafficking 50 some kilos of meth, even though nobody else's story uh, uh, collaborates that. Also, I'd like to touch on one last thing or one other thing. Um, so there's an individual in the book that came up in a lot of these people's proffers. Uh, we didn't mention her by name because it, it's not about her. It's more about the system that allowed it. But in the book, there's a correspondence between an agent and uh, or a lawyer and her at somebody's trial. And the lawyer's asking her, you know, how long has she been addicted to meth? How long has she been using meth? And she's been using it for an extensive amount of time. She was using it while she was cooperating with the, the federal government. Um, and they asked her, you know, about how many people have you cooperated with them on? And uh, I, I want to say she said hundreds. Um, that was a problem for us. For her to be able to cooperate on hundreds of individuals while using meth, which we all know uh, alters your perception of reality. Um, she is able to recall specific facts regarding how many grams of meth were sold each time by this person, how frequently with hundreds of individuals, it's, it's impossible. It doesn't make any sense at all. Even though that information was used to give these other individuals um, longer sentences in her request for a reduction in her time, 
her lawyer says uh, in a memo that, um, which is available on Pacer or uh, anywhere else for anybody to see if you look into these things, that uh, she, because of her cooperation, some individuals receive life sentences. So there's people sitting behind bars for life, even though uh, in another trial, she was asked by somebody's attorney, uh, can you can you point out my client after she went through this long list of them smoking meth together, uh, them selling meth together, how they graduated from grams of meth to ounces of meth. And when her when this guy's lawyer says, well, can you point out my defendant? She was unable to do so. So it, it's 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 a repeated thing where uh, the facts don't line up the the people that are being used uh to cooperate on these people are not uh reliable uh there's no there's no evidence i mean it's it's just one problem after another and i i again our hope is that uh, in hearing your podcast in reading the book and sharing the youtube videos that people will get involved and do what they can to to help them yeah, absolutely. And then when this comes out, um, you know, it, it's going to be on uh, everybody, you know, that hears this and, and is upset by it, you know, and this is maybe the first time you're hearing that this is how our, our justice system works. Um, start a watch party, share the episode, um, you know, tell people about it. And and Melissa Veach also had somebody who, who was... Uh, who proffered and, and explain what a proffer is for anybody out there. that doesn't understand. Cause I don't know exactly what a proffer is other, other than, you know, it's, it's a cooperating witness, but I mean, what is the actual, why do they call it a proffer? So when an individual is indicted, uh, they're offered the ability to proffer. Um, and basically the proffer is a protection uh, saying that the information that they give will not be used against them personally. But if as long as it's supposed to be, as long as they don't uh, lie or, or fabricate things, um, they will be given, they're usually promised some sort of reduction in time, whether that's a, a 5K1, which is prior to, or which is at sentencing, or a Rule 35, which is after sentencing. Uh, if their information is is deemed reliable and it results in um, some arrests or it, it results in in further investigations into other people, the problem uh, with the proffers is that there's no evidence. So it's just somebody going in a room and saying, "Hey, John, I seen John with a gun, and, and you know I know he's getting uh, meth from Mexico." And he sells me five ounces a week, uh, you know, for the last six months. And that information without anything other than that is used to give this individual an extensive amount of time. There's there's literally no other evidence outside of that. Yeah, yeah. And all. And, yeah. And also you had an, and where I was going with that was Melissa Veach's case where you had her proffer. Uh, so the, the main guy, uh, in her indictment, um, was in prison, right? That, or it's sometimes some, he got a reduction in his sentence because there was no way that what she, that the proffer said could have taken place because the time that she said it was what he was already in prison. And so oh. it, like it destroyed her whole, her whole deal. Right. I mean, it's like. And and the 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 screwed up thing about it is is that you know it's up to the government to get you into prison to prove to 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 uh, you know prove the facts and everything else. But once you once you're there, it's no longer up to them to prove that you're innocent, even though they they know that or it's been introduced to court that something's foul with the person who's who's uh, you know uh, cooperated against you. And you have to, you know, do all of that work yourself or have somebody on the outside that's willing to take the, uh, the initiative and, and, and dig deeper, right? Right. So let me touch on that. Uh, Kevin Kilo actually was just resentenced. Um, he's the one they had uh, an individual cooperate against him saying that he was, it was, actually it was a couple of them, 
saying that he um, sold this very large amount of meth. I want to say it was 56 kilos during a time frame that he was mostly in state prison. So when that was brought up, uh, he was told by the court system that even though the dates uh, were impossible, that the facts were right, that he committed these crimes. It just must not have been during these times. So he appealed it. The Fifth Circuit uh, came back and said, absolutely not. This well, These people gave specific dates and he was incarcerated. There's no way that this happened. They they send it they send it back to resentencing. This information can't be used. Later, uh, some agents look into uh, some past proffers and they find other information to use against him. And uh, his sentence went from, a, went from a life sentence. He got resentenced to 30 years. Also, to touch on what you just said, when these people are locked up, uh, when they go to prison. Um, it's pretty much done. Their lawyers have pretty much washed their hands with them. Um, they're given a year to file a 2255 saying, uh, challenging whatever they want to challenge in their sentence. The problem is none of them are lawyers. So for them to learn the law, learn how to file a motion, learn what goes in that. I mean, lawyers go to school for a very long time to learn this stuff. These guys are, are you know, some with minimal education are forced to figure it out within a year's time frame. And in that year, you know, like right now, they're locked down for the ma majority of the time. They have a difficult time getting to the law library. There, there's, it's, it's, the deck is literally stacked against them. There's no... There's no help. There's no outside resources. There's nobody to say, um, you know, oh, hey, you're struggling with how to file this or you you need a case law for this. So here we can help you. There's nobody there. So either you have the money for a lawyer or you pay uh, a jailhouse lawyer and hope that he knows what you're, he's doing or uh, you you let your 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 year you let your year uh, lapse. And when you do try to file something. They say that you're time barred. You waited too long. I mean, it, it, every step of the way, from the indictment all the way to they're in prison and they've exhausted all of their remedies, all of the options require these huge hurdles uh, that, that many of them have no idea how to get past or how to get around. So one of the so there's a couple of things that I want to I want to touch on and remind me if I veer veer off of forget this other one but one of them is going to be um, kind of give a description of what I think uh, what they're referring to as a conspiracy what I'm going to explain what that actually is compared to what it is that they're they're actually trying to say that they that they conspired uh, the other one is. Um, Ah, damn, I just forgot what it was. All right, well, I'll just go to that one. Um, so basically, what they're trying to say, I mean, this is the, this, I, I mean, it's almost like RICO. And if you, if you, you know, like a RICO case it, 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 to me, but um, the conspiracy is uh, they're trying to say, and I've read this because I have uh, access to Pacer. So I've read this in almost every single one of them and their explanation of it. And but what the real explanation is, is that like, so let's just say that I'm a drug addict and I'm living in Texas in the northern district and I have a drug problem and I, my day revolves around, you know, trying to figure out different ways of how I can get high or going and hanging out over at this person's house in the hopes that maybe they, somebody will show up where I can get high or maybe I've got twenty dollars for some drugs, but I want more. So I'm going to go and try to hook up with five other people and we're going to pool our money together and then we're going to go get some drugs. And then that way, instead of only getting $20 worth, I might get $50 worth for $20. So is that a conspiracy? Well, yeah. I mean, they're, yeah, they're conspiring in a certain way, but I mean, they're not conspiring in the way of, of what the, the, the federal government is trying to say. They're trying to say that they're conspiring on a level that, that, you know, they're going to be enriched with, with, you know, they've got access to hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of meth when it's not that at all. 
it's you've got low level drug addicts that are just literally like ants trying to figure out how to get their next fix and and survive and how they're going to eat and and take care of a kid that the, you know if they're a woman you know single mother uh and and in some cases a lot of these women are just the girlfriend of of the target you know what i mean that gets wrapped up that gets wrapped up into this 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 bull you know what i mean i, I don't i i don't want to cuss but i mean it would be right. it would be uh, good to do it right now uh you know to try to emphasize this man it's just crazy what what's allowed to 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 happen here and it's going to take everybody you know and, and you know the con which i i related to earlier the only reason that i figured out anything about this is that i watched that and it and it laid out the 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 foundation for the the mortgage and the financial uh system and how they uh how they manipulate us and they steal and they steal this is no different but the only come different is the commodity is people and labor you know because when yeah. they get you in when they get you into these these prisons for long extended periods of time all of these prisons have uh an industry or or uh you know the federal system is unicor but i mean state state prisons they make products too so you got yeah. a huge incentive uh, to lock people up for long periods of time because that fuels the uh, you know the prison industry, the prison industrial complex. So you're going to have you know lots of people, and you're going to have uh, you know because people are getting out. You know people get in trouble. They go to the shoe, which they lose their positions at at the Unicor. So they got to have a bunch of people ready to qualify people ready to fill those spots to keep that motor running. And it didn't change even through COVID, through who, some of the women that I've talked to, uh, and they, like, hey, you know, we're we're at this. The, they talk about social distancing, but yet still, they they have us going to Unicor every day. That hasn't stopped. Our programming has stopped. We can't go and do anything. We're locked down in the units. Uh, we can't go to school. We can't go uh, take any of our ACE classes. Anything that they need to do to program or exercise or anything. Uh, but yet they can still go to Unicor and work and make that dollar and you know for a dollar an hour, whatever it is, you know, it's crazy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I, I, I wanted to touch on a few of the, the parts that you just talked about. So, you know, as a struggling addict, money is always a concern. How do I buy for how do I come up with money for the next uh, high? And it, 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 it like you said, it obviously makes sense that an individual would pool together money with, uh, you know, two or three people in hopes that they would be able to buy, um, you know, enough drugs where they could take some out. And, you know, so, yes, they could use that as a conspiracy. But they're like you said, they're not charged on those levels. The second. Um, right now with covid. Uh, we've had so many of these people reach out to us and say, you know, like we're sick. We need help. Like there's people in here that are dying. I want to say that the Federal Bureau of Prisons has had 111 or it's over 100 deaths already. Um, there, There is an urgency now. Um, there's an urgency now more than ever that not only do these cases need to be looked into, but these people, uh, these nonviolent drug offenders uh, need to have some sort of relief, whether it's home confinement, whether it's whatever, and you extend uh, the amount of parole time, whatever it is, something needs to happen before more of these individuals die in there for for crimes that are, are not really crimes. I mean, nobody... Nobody, these are victims. They hurt, they were hurting themselves. They were going to get high. They were, you know, these are not people that were um, going out to hurt others. The other part of what you said that I, I wanted to touch on is um, the children. So when you said the single mothers, um, I, I can't tell you how many of the mothers talk about what their children are going through or what they've gone through watching their children grow up. Um, you know, they have 20 years and they're trying to explain that mommy's not going to be home, uh, you know, until you're 23 or 24. And 
the kids suffering. So in, in the back of the book, one of the mothers describes a situation where the father's actually incarcerated and the daughter is dealing with so much depression that uh, they're walking one day and she jerks away from her and jumps in front of a moving car. She's tried to kill herself uh, several times. And it, it, there's just this ripple effect of generations of damage for for nothing. Like I, I, I just, it's so difficult for us. Abe and I have, have struggled with, um, it's not just about them, you know. It's it's about the the parents that had to take over the custody of the children. It's about the children missing uh, their their family members. It's about the addiction being passed down uh, generation to generation, and and incarceration being the answer. Not you know we can help you. We wanna we wanna see you clean. We wanna see you as a productive member of society. You know, again, I just hope that in, in the sharing of this uh, podcast, in the book, in the YouTube videos, in everybody else that gets involved, even if you're only able to just share it to your Facebook page and share it to your friends, that there will be a growing awareness of how bad this is for these people and that there has to come a time where people say you know yeah this doesn't affect me like my normal life goes on but there's a kid somewhere who is absolutely traumatized by mom and dad being locked up for 20 30 years and there's a there's a man or a woman sitting in a cell right now who is nothing more than a struggling addict that that made some poor decisions in life and 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 you know they're they're trying to to social distance in an eight by you know six cell uh from from uh you know, an institution that, that has medical care that is uh, way below substandard. I mean, it's, it's just, it's incredibly sad to hear the hopelessness that comes from the families, the individuals that are locked up, the children. I, it's just heartbreaking. I, I really hope that, that this uh, results in some relief for them. Well, and, and, and to, to, to your point, it just doesn't affect them. This, this this could happen to anybody. So don't don't be fooled that this is just something that can you know that oh these people were just you know unlucky, uh, unfortunate, uh, all of that. No 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 no. This could happen to you too out there listening. This could happen to your family member. It could happen to your daughter. It could happen to your uncle that is struggling with addiction. And he just happens to go and buy from somebody, you know, that that is being uh, watched by the, you know, the DEA or or somebody. And, and just that interaction by itself would get him wrapped up in this whole conspiracy of of uh, of lies, basically. Um, you know, these people were, are never and, and, and let's be clear to you, too, that these people were never saying that they weren't guilty. Right. Right. They've never said that. Any of them that I've ever talked to said, you know, no, I, I am guilty. I have a criminal history. But what I'm guilty of is being addicted to methamphetamine. And right. that's it. You know, I'm not a drug dealer. And if they, and even if right. they did sell drugs, they were selling it to support a habit, not to not to make money and profit off of, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's a, another thing that we touch on in the book is that even though these individuals were accused of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and some of them millions of dollars worth of meth, that uh, there's not one seizure, not one person lost a house, a car, not a bank account, not a piece of jewelry. Uh, how are all of these hundreds of people able to hide their money so well? Or the money never existed. That's, yeah, that's what it was uh, never there. The, Right. It was never there. Right. You can't take so you can't seize something from somebody that doesn't have it to seize. But you can say whatever you want because it doesn't matter who's gonna. Right. Who, you know they're not. You know th this is a case which was really no different than the mortgage crisis where they were preying on the meek, the weak, and the ignorant. And this is yeah. no different. You know these these DEA agents. Uh, you know they preyed on the meek, the weak, and and the ignorant. You know, not that they're stupid, but they're they're uninformed uh, as to what their rights are, to what could possibly happen to them. Uh, and once they get there, they can't they can't fight it. You know what I mean? It's yeah. the low hanging. It's the low hanging fruit. And that's what 
Uh, I mean, I, I'm almost going to, I'm a man. And, and if anybody out there, look, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a deep dive into this and I'm going to need help from everybody on this. And, uh, you know, if you're out there and you're, you know, anything about this case, um, or you, you know, a uh, retired AUSA, uh, retired federal prosecutor in the Northern district of Texas, or, uh, you're you're actually a prosecutor now, and you wanna you wanna refute this. Uh, feel free to email me, man, and uh, we, you can we can talk about it for sure. Uh, I believe that you know a lot of this is tied into you know when the uh, and and none of this is well some of it's provable, but I mean if, if just look at the timelines of it, and this is going to be part of what I do too is uh, around the time when the crime bill passed, Clinton passed that crime bill. And private prison industry or the prison industry went privatized, and the war on drugs and also the uh, you know the flooding of crack cocaine in the inner cities. I think that's all tied together into uh, to this this whole deal. You know, to fill the prisons full of people for profit, uh, and that was just the mechanism of getting them in there. Uh, you know, we're in a, we're in a second age of enlightenment here where we're finding out a lot of the things that we thought were, were not, and what we thought it was, was not. So, uh, stay tuned for more of that. And if you have any information out there that can help towards this case, like I said, a retired prosecutor, uh, you know, uh, if you're the wife of a deceased prosecutor and you you know know of them you know being uncomfortable with some of the uh cases that they had come forward and talk uh you know it's you're just going to be helping save somebody's life man because these people didn't deserve to go to prison for 30 40 50 life sentences man they they needed they needed a second chance um and uh and, and uh treatment you know, not, not, not this. So, yeah, I so, mean, I, I there's nothing more that I can say. I'm just, I'm just, I'm flabbergasted, man. I mean, it's like, I, I couldn't yeah. imagine like, like my family member having to go through something like that. You know, and I just want to touch on one more thing that there's, uh, there's this view out there in some circles that uh, being tough on crime is uh, um, something to be applauded. And in some aspects, I, I understand that, but it, 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 like so many things in our society, it becomes an extreme and being tough on crime becomes being tough on everything. And uh, these people have been pulled into that. So I, I think that's another thing for people to look at when they talk about, uh, you know, we're looking for somebody who's tough on crime or we're looking for somebody who's going to, you know, do this or that, that, uh, that there's real consequences behind uh, these mass incarcerations. But uh, we're really grateful for you taking the time to have us here today. No, thank you. And, and, and people need to understand that, that when they talk about tough on crime, when they talk about, you know, socialism, these are all boogeymen that are made to, that are, that are inflated to get you to vote for somebody. You know what I mean? If you really were to look at the the stats and the numbers, man, it's not as, it's not as bad as they tried to, uh, to make it out to be. So, yeah, I mean, you know, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate everything that you're doing. Uh, there's also one, one last thing in, in, is there anywhere that we can go to uh, like help, support these women like is there uh, petitions that we can sign uh uh anything like that on change.org or or anywhere we can go i know I, I can't remember if you had anything on your youtube uh channel yeah yes so in the videos that we have posted uh in the description of the video there is a petition um asking uh for relief uh, in their sentences, but I would suggest that all people uh, go to the back of the book and contact these people. There's a list of, I want to say 65 people there, and there's many, many, many more. Um, reach out to their family members. They have their BOP number there. Reach out to them. Um, find out, you know, their 
story, what can be done. And it's all about getting these stories in, into the hands of people that can make change. So the president, uh, you know, congressional leaders, uh, anybody and everybody that's uh, that's needed. But yes, the petitions are in the description of the video in the YouTube channel. All right, and one thing. So, since they've exhausted all of their their uh, their means of of appeals and all of that other stuff, I mean, at least a, a majority of them, and there's still people being wrapped up and in, in interwoven into this conspiracy out of the Northern District of Texas, even today. Some of, they're still trying yeah. to to you know what I mean. So, the 150 that you talked to is probably up to like 600 now that are in this one indictment. Um, yeah, there's or 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 one conspiracy. Yeah, absolutely. There's 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 definitely many. And uh, like I said, we didn't have the uh, manpower to be able to go through all these cases. But there are uh, it's 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 uh, it's very daunting when you start receiving these paperwork pamphlets, when these family members are calling like, you know, hey, we've been praying for something. Thank you for listening. And there's, uh, you know, just hundreds of people reaching out. I mean, it's, it's very daunting. So yeah, absolutely. Sign the petitions, uh, reach out to the family members, reach out to the individuals that are incarcerated. Uh, they have, a lot of them have their paperwork. They have the, the court documents proving uh, what happened. They have, um, you know, all, all of the things that are needed for somebody of common sense to say there's something wrong here. So that's where I would start for sure. Uh, and then obviously sharing this podcast so other people can hear about it, sharing the YouTube channel, sharing the book so people can read and, and understand with knowledge comes responsibility. Once you know you, you, it demands an answer, whether you do nothing or something, you have to, you have to decide what side of the fence you're going to uh, sit on. Yeah. Also too, if you're out there and you want to help, and you and you have a, a way to help whether that's you know doing some research doing uh like anything that you that you think that may be helpful in this feel free to reach out to me at uh my email here or uh hit the uh the link tree uh and that has every way that you can connect to my show or to me or anything that i'm doing and uh trust me man we're, we're, we're getting ready to go a little bit further into this and uh you know what what's going to get what's going to come from it uh who knows but uh this this definitely needs to be put out there it needs to be shared um and and we need to expose all of the different injustices and and corruptions that are happening out there that are coming to light that's the only way we're going to make a change absolutely well, I want to thank you. We're at about an hour and four right now. Um, I appreciate everything that you've done. Like I said, uh, you know, anybody else out there, help, help, man. Uh, hook up with, uh, with with us in any way. Buy the book. Check it out. It's, uh, it's a great book. I've, I've, I've talked to some of the people in it, and we'll be interviewing some of the other ones uh, at some point down the road. Uh, and this is something that's going to be continuing uh, on my on my end until I get it to where I need it to go. And, you know, I'm not going to talk a whole lot about that, but you know what I'm talking about. And you're you're yeah, in and it to win it. too. Ava. Yeah, Ava and I are definitely committed to this. And um, Dusty, we're all absolutely committed. So, yeah, thank you so much. All right. I appreciate it. And, uh, you know, good luck to both of you. And, and you know, we're going to be working uh, pretty close side by side from here on out until we get some uh, results that we're looking for. So I appreciate it. And there will be more to come on this for sure. Thanks. So you guys take care. You take care, too. All right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.